Welcome to our webinar about storage performance density, the key to Rackscale data center performance. My name is Mark Stamer. I'm the president and chief Dragon Slayer of Dragon Slayer Consulting. I've been doing this for over 20 years and been in the industry over 38, and I help client, my clients improve their marketing and help end users with their problems at no cost to them. That's why you see the contact information on the screen. If you have any issues, give me a call. So let's get right into it. Delusions are difficult to overcome, and I like telling stories. And this is a story about a young man who believed he was dead. His parents were worried, so they sent him to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist spent the whole hour trying to convince the young man he wasn't dead. He wasn't getting anywhere. So he pulled out his medical book, and he showed the young man. He says, look what it says here. It says, dead people don't bleed. Do you believe that? And he shrugged a little. He says, okay, I, yeah, I guess I believe that. So the psychiatrist whips out a pin and sticks him in the finger, and he starts to bleed. And he says to the young man, so what does this tell you? And the young man's eyes gets really big, and he says, oh, my God, dead people do bleed. Delusions are difficult to overcome. And that's true in technology. I mean, today we have two primary performance storage models. You have the scale up, and you have the scale out. They're different, and VR Satish will talk about that later. But generally, they each have an issue when it comes to storage performance density. You know, what is storage performance density? To begin with, you know what capacity density is, right? The amount of terabytes per RU. But performance density is the amount of IOPS and bandwidth or bytes per second per RU, rack unit. Modern applications require a lot of performance and a lot of performance density. For all the different things like from automation to AI to security and compliance. But in general, they need more than they usually get. And they have storage performance density problems that are preventing them from getting what they need, from scaling data center operations or, or the fact that they're not getting good utilization or can't get elastic performance, or they, they have too much data movement, or they don't have enough compliance and security in the timeframes that they have. If we look at it a little deeper, from a scaling data center operations, you end up with excess, excessive SKUs. You have the inability to get your applications production and market as when you want. You end up with siloed infrastructure. When we talk about decreased utilization, you have incredible waste from three copy memory. You have three times the capacity you gotta have. So not only does it affect performance density, but also capacity density. So it limits scaling. And then when you talk about elastic performance, not being able to get it, it's because you have to end up moving certain applications off host, like test dev and DevOps and analytics and workflows, which reduces scale and increases cost. And then there's a variability on performance. So to affect that variability, you have to move data to make sure you get as consistent performance as you possibly can. And you have this coarse granularity when it comes to changes, which affects the amount of data you have to move on an ongoing basis. All this adds cost and adds complexity. And then you have the issue of compliance. Today, that's very expensive with things like GDPR in Singapore and California. So as a result, you spend a lot of money to prevent being costed a lot of money. Like GDPR, it's a minimum of a 10 million euro fine. And so you have longer audit windows and you got to use third party software, which affects performance for the other applications. It gets frustrating. And when we look at it from the key issue here, it's an architectural issue. In scale out, you have the applications and the storage software contending for the same CPU and memory resources, which slows one another down. And storage software is very resource intensive. And so with the all flash array scale up, you have other issues. One, the big key issue is you don't have enough controllers. The controllers become the bottleneck. And so you end up with poor capacity per RU, poor performance per RU, excessive power and cooling, premium pricing, unwarranted TCO, and all of which causes big iron. And you see these big refrigerator of racks of, of storage just to try to get the performance. So I'm gonna finish with another story. And this is about Einstein's chauffeur. Einstein at the end of his career was on the rubber chicken circuit, giving lectures all the time. And he gave the same lecture. And he was complaining to a chauffeur going to his next lecture, I'm tired of this, I am bored, I don't want to do this anymore. And the chauffeur says, look, sir, I know your, your speech by heart. And I could give it for you. I even know the questions and how to answer them. I've watched you a hundred times. And then fortunately, the chauffeur looked a lot like Einstein. 
And so the chauffeur says, why don't you let me give this speech? Einstein thinks about it for a moment and says, okay. So they come to the location, they change clothes. Chauffeur gets up and gives the speech. It's exactly like Einstein. Answers all the questions exactly like Einstein until the end. And there's one guy stands up and asks this incredibly convoluted, very detailed, very complex question. And the chauffeur nods his head sagely and he says, you know, that question is so simple, I'm going to let my chauffeur answer it. And now for the real Einstein who can tell you how to solve this problem, VR Satish, CTO of Pavilion Data. VR? Thank you, Mark, for the wonderful intro. Um, I'm VR Satish. I've been doing storage for over 20 years. I'm currently the CTO of Pavilion Data. Now, letting, getting back to the problem, you know, Mark had talked about you know, how there are distinct models of storage architecture in the data center. So let me recap that a little bit. There are two distinct architectures, as we can see. The scale-up architecture, which is what we've been doing for the last you know, 10 to 15 years around sand storage, big iron storage, buying from you know, huge successful vendors and uh, connected through some kind of a fabric to a bunch of servers. And there's a lot of pooling, a lot of you know, processes that are built around it, and it's ingrained in the operations of a data center. There's a second model, which is the new kid on the block. It's all about scale out. We see, you know, Hadoop, big data kind of workloads. We see, you know, Spark. We see all these new real-time analytics kind of workloads and, and uh, applications that are demanding better performance, more capacity, and more agility. And to satisfy some of these requirements, we're actually building out scale out architectures. These are primarily driven by the, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world who have started this quite some time back. Now, in data centers, in enterprises, do we really need to deal with these two different silos? Because one has ingrained processes in it, one is the, new, the other one is the new kid on the block. How can we, or is it even possible to have a single architecture that can work for both of these cases? get the benefits of both of them. So let's double click on the scale out architecture for a second. One of the biggest challenges you get with scale out architecture is infrastructure sprawl. We all hear every now and then saying, you know, the big companies are creating another data center. They're starting another one in Greenland. They're starting another one in Iceland. This is all because of infrastructure sprawl. Because one of the big things about, you know, building a data center is how do you keep the data center small? How do you reduce the infrastructure sprawl? How do you not have discrete operating procedures for different applications or application silos? And how do you lower the cost? That's the most important stuff. So in order to understand and unify these two architectures and build a better data center, more efficient data center, it is foundationally important to look at the definition of what a storage performance density is. Now we all know density from our physics classes. Density is all about mass over volume. So the lesser dense something is, the more space it's gonna occupy. The more space it occupies, the more money you have to throw on it for you know, space, cooling, power, all that stuff. So storage performance density tries to quantify how much of space is required for a unit of IOP. IOPS is basically IOs per second. Now, if you look at performance density, they're defined by two distinct formulas. The number of IOPS you can get from a single rack unit and the amount of bandwidth you can get from a single rack unit. And we will see as we go forward why these are important. We all know performance density really matters because we've seen this transition happen in the cell phone industry. You know, if you look at cell phones today, they're extremely powerful. They can do what desktops and servers could do they've started to do today. And they're constantly pushing the barrier to the limits. We can see today a single iPhone or an Android phone, you know, they have packed 64 bit six core processors in them, a lot of memory in them, and lots of peripherals, cameras, all sorts of things are inside, the batteries, all of that. And they want to package all this stuff into a really, really small factor, a uh, small factor that can fit in your pocket. That's what makes it all usable. Why would somebody carry a phone if it were as big as a laptop and go everywhere. They would never do it. So 
with all the costs rising, power cooling, the amount of data, the space, everything is rising. It's important for us to design systems, design data centers that are incredibly dense and incredibly performant because, hey, at the end of the day, data is growing and you need to do more with less. That's the whole formula here. So another look at the stuff, if you look at how people are been doing traditional storage architectures, the ones which you saw, uh, ones which you use for, you know, which are put behind a storage area network. These are large, big iron systems. The focus of them was lots of performance and moderate capacity. That's what the focus of them was. Now, because of big data coming in, the capacity value has increased, but at the same time, performance has not kept up with it. It has to both linearly increase. That's the most important stuff. So we've seen, you know, new arrays which are coming out, which are actually very fast. They can do, you know, millions of IOPS. But what's the cost? What's the catch? The catch here is they occupy a whole lot more space. For example, what good is can we take something that is worth 80 RUs, that means two full racks worth of space occupation, two full racks worth of power and cooling requirements, and shrink it down to a form factor which is as low as a couple of RUs or four RU, or six RU, whatever it is, but dense it up much more. Give both performance as well as from a capacity point of view. Now, if you're able to do that, maybe we can design an architecture for the data center that can actually combine, you know, both for both the workloads. Now, so let's step back and look at the requirements. What do the scale out applications need? What do the traditional workloads need. The traditional workloads, they require moderate performance. I wouldn't say they require great performance. They require moderate, for the majority of the cases, they require moderate performance, but they really require, you know, reliability, availability, you know, pooling of resources so that they can be cheaper to operate and all that. They also had to be uh, very, very, you know, serviceable, uh, very uh, modular and flexible. This all comes in because of the requirements, the availability requirements that are required there. On the scale out side, they're very simple. I care about performance, I care about agility, and I care about getting my job done fast because the data is so big. Just keep adding servers and you're done with this stuff. Now, if we were to combine these two in some way, I satisfy the requirements of what are required for the scale out while not giving up some of the advantages that were traditionally available in full shared storage. The key thing here is can we draw the line somewhere in the middle, not go all the way to one side where you share totally as we were doing in the sand, or go all the other way in the pendulum to say we share absolutely nothing. Can we do some amount of limited sharing so we get the benefits of both worlds? So that's typically how I would, what I would call our black scale architecture. Think about a rack as a unit of a server. Now, think about storage being disaggregated from inside each of these servers to the bottom of the store, bottom of the rack. And you just cookie cut this rack across the board to build your data center. What's the advantage you get out of this? A, you make the servers much more denser. Instead of using a 2U, you can actually go down to a 1U. You increase the performance density right there. Second, you are consolidating storage, so you can actually share them amongst the servers that are within the rack. And that's some amount of sharing, not total sharing, but at the end of the day, it increases your utilization because you don't have to make those three copies that Mark alluded to. Now, in order to build this kind of a storage, you need it to be small because you don't want it to be occupying the whole rack because there's absolutely going to be no space for servers. You need to be really, really small and dense because you need to have the capacity for all the 20 servers that are within that rack. And the other important stuff is, if you assume that each of these servers in the scale art architecture were to have just two SSDs in each one of them, and if you assume 20 servers in a rack, that means with each, SSD, each server doing half a million IOPS, you would have to deliver at least 10 million IOPS from the storage device. Now, this is the biggest challenge. Unfortunately, we don't have a system that is really, really fast, that can deliver in the north of 10 million IOPS and really, really dense, that can hold the capacity that, is, that can just need of every server and every application that is running in that rack. That's the challenge. So we saw this opportunity at Pavilion Data and we built a system. We built a storage array for modern applications that is designed for rack scale. 
this is not a storage system that is designed for the traditional SAN kind of a model. It's designed for Axio. So what did we do? We gave it extreme performance. We gave it up to 20 million IOPS. So there's a lot of headroom here. 120 gigabytes worth of bandwidth at low latency. Now, the next important stuff we did, we did extreme density. Now, what this means is you can now, within that for you, not add more and more appliances and use up half the rack again, you can go all the way from 14 terabytes to a petabyte. We also made sure that it was extremely serviceable and non-disruptive to enter into the enterprise. We made sure that we absolutely required no software presence on every server, so it's very simple to deploy and simple to manage and use and maintain. Now, once we had that system, we could now slot it in the bottom of the rack because it just occupies very little space. You can fill up the rack, remaining space in the rack with your servers, dense it up, go all the way to one U or even half U for that matter, and get all the storage that you need on demand. So if a server needs five terabytes, it gets five terabytes. If it needs two terabytes tomorrow, it gets two terabytes. That's the flexibility, that's the fluidity that you get. Now, once you remove storage as one of the deciding factors of what kind of server that you want, because the storage can say it needs to be fast, it needs so much capacity, there's so many variables there, you automatically drop the number of SKUs that, you're required, that are required to operate your data center. This has a direct impact and moreover, looking at it at a rack scale, you can start scaling your data center operations. Now, the fact that we're doing some limited amount of sharing within the rack, you increase the utilization right away off the bat because you no longer need to do you know, multiple copies. Elastic performance, if a system can give up to 20 million IOPS and the requirements are around 10 million IOPS, give or take a few million here and there, you have the room, you have the freedom to go ahead and deploy these applications that can today be hungry in performance, tomorrow not necessarily being hungry, but somebody else wants more. And reducing data movement is another big one. All the benefits and all the processes we had in a shared storage architecture around, for example, taking a LUN in a shared storage, making a snapshot of it, mounting it out to another device, doing a backup or a compliance scan or security scan, whatever it is, not impacting the primary application performance, all that is possible with this new architecture. In essence, you get the benefits of both the uh, modern architectures, which is scale out, agile, you just add more and more racks, think about the rack as a unit, and you get the benefits of shared storage where you get all the uh, increased utilization, you know, reducing data movement and all that. We have just built and given some insight into how you may want to go about building your next generation data centers with a rack scale architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, VR and Mark. If you joined us late today and were not able to view the entire webinar, a recording will be emailed out after today's event. We will now move into the question and answer portion of the webinar. Please submit your questions for either VR or Mark via the GoToWebinar interface, and we will answer as many questions as possible. Let's move to our first question. VR, one viewer asks, how do you achieve that level of performance in 4RU? That's an excellent question, and that's part of the fundamentals of designing a highly performant density system. Uh, it's not enough if you just throw up more and more storage into a particular enclosure. Like we see many people coming out today and said, hey, I got a one RU with half a petabyte or I got a two RU with you know petabyte. Capacity is one thing. We have to make sure that we have enough juice and bandwidth that can flow through the controllers so that they can access all that storage out there and give great performance. So the way we did that was actually packing in more than 20 controllers inside a small 4U form factor. Now, what this means is uh, one may scratch their head and said, wow, I don't need 20 right now. So the biggest advantage of the box, like how we sell is within that 4U, you can start with two controllers and grow as your demand grows and add more and more controllers if you want to increase performance and add more and more storage if you want to increase capacity. The key to getting a well-balanced system, especially in the era of NVMe, is to not only look at how, many, how much storage you can pack into it, but also look at how many controllers you can pack into the stuff. Great, thanks, VR. The next question is, 
why can't I drop NVMe drives and Ethernet adapters into a server and get the same level of performance? That's an excellent question. So if you look at one of the biggest challenges we have with the current server-side architect, I mean, in the name of software defined, we have a tendency to believe that everything that is software defined has to start with the server. And I think this question is along those lines. Why can't we take a server, put a bunch of disks in there, and put some software, and voila, you got a storage array. That was great when the uh, media was actually very slow. So if you were, and you didn't need, most of the time, the bottleneck was the media. So the CPUs would essentially be waiting for the media to serve up the data. Now in the era of NVMe, the media is actually extremely fast. So there's not enough wait time in the CPUs to actually you know, serve all the requests. So this means you take a server and you have just two sockets, uh, two CPUs in them, and you put you know, 24 NVMe drives or so, you're not gonna get anywhere close to the bandwidth. Let's take a simple example of the Intel's latest processors. If you take the number of PCIe lanes, PCIe is a technology used to connect CPU with the peripherals. It's a, it's a low latency, uh, high bandwidth protocol. And if you, it's PCIe, essentially the bandwidth is countered by the number of lanes that are available for it that can go from the CPU. Typically you're looking at roughly around 35 to 40 available for anything that is storage related. Now, if you divide it by two, 24 coming inside, which is the network side, and 24 going down south towards the uh, media, that basically says you have 20 lanes to go into the NVMe media. Now, each NVMe media requires four lanes. Now, if you look at it more carefully, that means at the most, you can actually drive up to five media, five NVMe media. So anybody who is basically coming in and saying, I got a... Um, single socket server packed with 24 media. I mean, they're just, it's, it's, it's more a marketing gimmick. Uh, you're not going to be really utilizing the speed of you know the 24 media, NVMe media at all. So you might as well put five NVMe media and put the remaining in SATA drives and that's just fine. This is one of the fundamental reasons why you can't just take a server. You, you really have to think differently. One of the big things which we also did to, to talk a little bit more is we actually asked a very simple question. You walk into the data center and you ask a question, what is the one device that can actually ingress a terminal line rate? And those are not the servers. Those are the not how to do high performance at scale. And the server guys, by the way, are still figuring this out. I mean, and the storage guys too. And uh, being a storage guy, you know, I just have to accept where we have not had that much about our innovation. So we stepped back and said, why don't we borrow some of the principles from what the networking guys did and try to build a system ideas from the networking world with the ideas from the storage world and the server world and see if we can build a device that can actually switch a terabyte, it can store a terabit per second and retrieve a terabit per second. So this, we designed the pavilion data systems very similar to how a, instead of egressing out to the ports, we just egress out to the NVMe devices, and that's how we're able to get phenomenal bandwidth and low latency. Thank you, VR. How does the cost compare to installing NVMe drives into a server and making three copies of my data? Well, that's an excellent question. At the end of the day, you know, <laughs> I, I recently um, came across a gentleman who actually uh, made an interesting comment. He basically said the cost of an NVMe media with a particular model and capacity in a high-end array is actually, let's say, $40,000 per terabyte, terabyte. The same media, if, if it's put in a mid-size, mid-range mid array, is $20,000. And you take the same media and put it in the server, it's $4,000, right? So obviously where cost pressure is there, one may want to just go and put it inside the server and you get what you want. You get, even if you do, it work out pretty better. Now, 
see from a cost perspective, I don't think you can beat um, just putting vanilla NVMe drive because there's a lot of value added to the storage array guys from an operational standpoint of view, from the amount of SKUs that you can reduce. Um, and you can offset some of these cost barriers by removing some of the copies. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, it all depends on what do you say from power and cooling? What do you say from the amount of rack having a server sprawl? Um, you know, lots and lots of SKUs. And if you do a total TCO analysis on the stuff, I mean, quantifiable TCO, not even looking at, you know, the, you know, the unquantifiable, you would see that roughly around, you'll get a saving of roughly around, you know, 50, 60% over just putting NVMe drives on, in, in DAS. That's, that's my personal opinion there. Next question. With the investments I have made in server-side capacity, would that be wasted if I switched to Pavilion Solution? There are two. One of the biggest challenges having a server with NVMe drives is, you know, companies like Intel and AMD, they're constantly innovating. And they come out with the processor maybe once every year or maybe two years. So there's a tendency for us to reach maximum three years. Obsolete, they become slow, and you want to keep it up to date. For other reasons, performance on the compute side. Now, what do we do when we get rid of a server? It goes out with the storage because we can just add another server and everything gets rebalanced. So our storage refresh cycles are being controlled by server refresh cycles. And that has a much faster way of obsoleting your storage at all, which is absolutely not needed, actually, in some cases. So separating these two out gives the benefit that you can now have different, both the uh, side. Um, so at, at, the, at the end of the day, um, you can still take the, you know, you should you should wait for an announcement from us uh, within the next couple of weeks, where we'll you know talk a little bit more about the specific case, how we can we allow in Pavilion data to kind of repurpose this whole concept of uh, uh, just 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 wait for it. Great, okay, thank you, Vr. We have time for about two more questions. Uh, what interconnect do you use to talk to the host, and why did you choose that? Okay, so like I kept alluding to, I mean, we are a storage array. We, we uh, quack like a duck, we swim like a duck, and we'll walk like a duck. And we're a duck at the end of the day. We're a storage array. Um, but it's a very different storage array. It's not, like I said, it's not designed for in the SAN. It's more for rack scale architecture to replace DAS, if I may use that word, direct attached storage. Um, the interconnect we use, we use NVMe or Fabric. So if you go to our website, you can actually see that our box actually has 40, 40 gigabit gigabit ports behind it. So you take these ports out. These are Ethernet ports. Uh, you take these ports out and connect them to your servers. And uh, if you're using Linux, one of the latest versions, um, you have all the drivers built in, you don't have to do anything. Uh, you use NVMe uh, commands to connect to these remotely served, um, call that, and, and you're off to go. So the real thing is we, the protocol we use underneath is NVMe or Fabric. There are two kinds of Fabric we support. We support RDMA uh, over Ethernet. Uh, the Rocky uh, model, and we also support TCP. So if you have a RDMA compliant uh, NIC card on the server, you could use RDMA and you would get phenomenal latency uh, guarantees. And if you don't have that luxury, uh, you could use TCP and the latency is going to be slightly increased, maybe around 25 to 30%, but the bandwidth will be the same.
Okay, we have time for one last question. I do not have any applications that require 20 million IOPS. Why would I need this much performance? Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, look at how virtualization first started off. You know, servers were becoming faster and faster and faster. And people said, geez, I'm not utilizing my server that fast. So let me do some amount of virtualization and pack it up. So you would run, you know, 30 virtual machines on a server and you found out that now the servers are choking. So in essence, and so looking at it as a single application, can it fill up or can it drive the utilization all the way to 100%? Multiples of that application in a server, can it drive the performance? Can it drive the utilization all the way up? Similarly, in the storage land, instead of looking at a single application requiring 20 million IOPS, we have to look at all the stuff that can run in a rack. That's quite a bit with, with um, containerization coming in, with virtualization out there. So once you take the cumulative um, needs, the IOP needs for all the applications that run inside a rack, then I would say that even you know 20 million, you'd be cutting it close. Great, thank you, VR. We have run out of time for questions today. For those of you who submitted questions that we did not have time to answer, we will follow up with you directly. We would value your feedback in the brief survey that you will be presented with after today's event. If you would like to learn more about Pavilion Data, please visit www.paviliondata.com. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining us.